it's something different than an organized sport, you know. It's not a baseball field or a soccer field that has lines drawn from one side to the other. It's not refining how to hit a baseball that's coming at you at 90 miles an hour. There's nothing wrong with that, it's fun too, but you know, whether you're in the mountains or you're on the beach, it's wide open wilderness. There's no boundaries, there's no rules. You're just out there exploring every day or you're out on an adventure every day. It's, it's a culture, it's a lifestyle. I think the thing that drives action sports is progression. If you get to a level where you're learning stuff daily and every day is something new and every day you jump on your skis, it's, it's a new experience. I think that in any sport keeps people going because if you learn one thing, the thing you want to do right away is learn the next hardest thing. Not only skiing, but skateboarding, snowboarding, FMX, surfing. I mean, we're all the same. It's the same breed of people. What just keeps driving that is just wanting that next rush, wanting that next, that next feeling of accomplishment, you know what I mean? Because that feeling right there is the best feeling you'll ever get, no matter what. With most traditional sports, it's man versus man. It's a team versus a team. There's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. The rules are set and it's a battle and the drama that unfolds through that battle is kind of what keeps people interested in watching. But in action sports, it actually doesn't work like that at all. It's not such a battle of man versus man. It's a battle of improving yourself. Most of the guys that are competing out there are friends. And they're, uh, they're pushing each other. And, and you don't hope that the guy you're going against falls. You're kind of cheering him on and hoping that he does something that might help you push yourself to the next level. And whether it's skateboarding or BMX or snowboarding or skiing, the rule book's constantly changing. In fact, you could never really write an effective rule book because the sport changes on a monthly, sometimes a weekly basis. It's a sport about trying to do something new, push yourself, and trying to take what you do to the next level. That's the thing that drives action sports. Back in the mid-90s, freestyle skiing was really at a point of stagnation. Um, you know, from its freedom of the 70s where it was all about creativity and doing crazy things, uh, it, it kind of, you know, gradually got broken down with more and more rules and became a sport that, uh, th that there was almost a formula to do, be it moguls or aerials, there was a way to do it and everyone was doing it and everyone ended up looking the same. The courses were the same, didn't matter where you went. And it kind of, honestly, to me, it started getting boring. Jean-Francois Cusson from Quebec, another one of the kids, 18 years of age from St. Agathe. Last year, he won the Canada Games. He threw a 720 in that run. Absolutely an incredible talent. At the same time, most of the people that were sort of the creative minds of the time were going into snowboarding. And there was a lot of energy in snowboarding at that time. And, and uh, it was, uh, as a serious skier, it was a bit of a bummer. Okay, that is a snowboarding move. He does a 360, <laughs> does a little rail grab on this side. This is a new wave of skiers that Jean-Luc Broussard is talking about. And they're throwing everything in right now. 26.86 the time, 20.25 the points. Watch this. Does grabs the ski, beautiful. Now, I know, Meredith, you do that all the time on your snowboard, that move. I was a mogul coach for the Canadian freestyle team, and on my team were Shane Zox, 
Vincent Dorian, J.P. Eau Claire, and J.F. Cusson. And uh, we were all kind of like-minded people. We were all getting a little bit bored of sort of the status quo of mogul skiing, where it was almost becoming kind of robotic. And you know, we were kind of talking about what was going on in skiing and, and this rise of snowboarding and all these cool tricks they were doing. And we were like, you know what? For sure, we can do all that stuff on skis. On our days off, we would go out and just try and dream up new tricks. You know, all started pushing each other, seeing who could come up with the next new thing. Sort of figure out how to do a misty flip and some 720s with grabs and all this kind of stuff. And we made a little video. And that was around the same time that uh, Shane Zox went to the SIA trade show in Las Vegas and met a guy named John DeCesare, who was uh, a mogul skier that was into making films. They, they weren't Shane Zox and Mike Douglas. They were at this event in Snowbird. There was like the Canadian crew that came down. And they all had fake names because they were on the World Cup team or they were just about to make the World Cup team for Canada and they weren't allowed to do pro contests. And uh, they smoked everybody. They were just like super good. And ironically enough, in Las Vegas, I was showing a movie that I made called Fade to Black. And it was in the mogul booth, the professional mogul booth. This red-haired kid came by with his buddy, and it was Shane Zox, and he's like, hey man, we like your movie. It's about moguls and freestyle, it's cool. I was like, oh, thanks, you know? And they gave him this tape, they're like, you should check this out. And I put it in and it was like the first Misty flip I'd ever seen on snow and a couple of other things. It was a little VHS tape that I put into a little tiny like 12 inch TV and I was like, whoa, skiing just changed forever. It was kind of like one of those times when you know, you really felt like you were at the start of something and uh, it didn't matter skier or snowboarder, everyone was sort of starting to take notice of what we were doing and, and Johnny started documenting it and uh, the first movie that that we put out with Johnny that had our footage in it was called State of Mind and and that kind of really kicked off Poor Boys Productions. There were this group of mogul kids, freestyle kids, that wanted to do nothing more than flip and spin. It was nothing that um, I had seen and, and it, it didn't make sense to anyone else. Like if they were to do something like that in a freestyle contest they would get deductions and what they were doing was totally free and different and it was almost like against the rules. Right after the movie came out, we knew we were, you know, we were a part of a sport that was changing. The skis were changing, everything was changing. We knew we were, we were gonna go away from moguls and all that kind of stuff. Not that they weren't cool, it's just we wanted to do this. And they just kept pushing it and pushing it. It was game on. I mean, we were just learning tricks every week. New things were going down. Switch, straight, flipping, twisting, grabbing. It didn't matter. We were, uh, we were just trying everything we could think of. Every time we went anywhere, whether it be a contest or a film shoot, something new was going down in skiing. There was something new being created on every shoot. I mean, it was so young and, and so raw that Every time we pulled the camera out or built a jump, something different was happening. It was like the new move or the coolest thing ever it just happened. And it happened every week. Back in those days when we first started doing it, there weren't such things as terrain parks. They were called snowboard parks and they were full of snowboarders. And in fact, at most of them, skiers weren't even allowed in. You know, it was, it was tough. It was a challenge just, you know, in the beginning, just to be allowed into the pipe and not get kicked out. But we quickly realized that on, on a pair of skis and the way that you could stand, that it wasn't that hard to catch a lot of air in the half pipe. Simon's competitiveness started when I think he was born. Um, you know, he was ill at 18 months old with epiglottitis. He had meningitis and um, he fought through that. And the minute he was out of incubation, he was running all over the place um, and just wanting to, to just get into everything. And I think having an older brother also contributed to his competitiveness because his older brother was extremely athletic. And they're 18 months apart. So just natural ability is different just in 18 months, but that didn't stop Simon. You know, you generally ride a bike at a certain age, and Adam was riding a bike. Well, Simon thought age isn't 
a factor. He should be able to ride a bike if his brother can do that. And he did. Um, you know, and that was mostly, you know, any sport, soccer, baseball. You'd see Simon out there, he was a small ch child, and all the other kids were maybe two feet taller than he was, but he was out there uh, competing in all the sports that they were doing, and he was phenomenal. His competitiveness and flair was always his um, identity. We talked about potentially him, you know, being able to go to college through a gymnastics scholarship because he was so talented in gymnastics. But it was becoming too regimented, and he has a zest for fun. If it's not fun, or there isn't that potential to take it to another level of, of unknown, it doesn't drive him as much. So when he got to that level in gymnastics where you had to come in and do your stretches, do your exercises, practice very regimented um, pieces, it, it wasn't as fun. And then one day they started doing, they called them helicopters at the time, and he used his spotting that you really work hard at through gymnastics in his skiing and it, it like clicked. Tried to do the mogul thing for about, it's about a year and uh, it was fun. I mean, it was cool to get on the competitive scene a little bit, skiing. And the thing that shied me away from that a little bit was just uh, kind of the regulations or the coaching or you had to do things a certain way and um, that wasn't me. I met Simon pretty far back. We were up in Mammoth. I was hanging out with Greggy. We were shooting a bunch of Oakley athletes, and it was a big jump. Everyone was hitting the jump, some locals crushing it, and all of a sudden, this ball of fire just comes out. He's like four feet tall and starts throwing like 1080s. Greg and I looked at each other like, what was that? You know, the very first time I met him, he was really young. He was fully charging 110% everywhere he go, just trying to go as big and as fast as possible, and you could just tell by his riding that he had something, you know. There's only a few people in the world that you can tell, especially at younger ages, you know, that, you know, that person's gonna go pretty far places if he just keeps a good head on him. I remember him just standing out all of a sudden. In every lap, we were like, who's this kid? And at one point, we just said, call him over here. We were like, hey, kid. You know, and he, he rolls up to us, and he's about that tall. And we asked his mom, we're like, how old is he? And he's like, oh, he's 13. Like, 13, oh my god. And right there, Greg and I were like, that was a pinnacle point. He went from East Coast kid, coming out to watch his brother snowboard to traveling eight months a year. He was on the road from that day forward. I think Simon was like changed. It's a big thing at 13 years old to, to say this is what I want for the rest of my life. I'm gonna do everything and anything necessary to get to that point. I was winning X Games when he was still skiing moguls. So it's like, I think I was one of the first guys where he kind of looked at and was like, you know what, it's on. I know what I want to do. Tanner and all these guys, Yoon, like, looks like a good style of skiing and just comes in, you know, he had the respect for me and then how fast I grew the respect for him just being like, yeah, man, never really seen a motivated person like that in my whole life. I felt when I came in, people like, you know, the Tanner Halls, the Yoon Olsons, the Dave Crichtons, they were bringing, you know, unique style and that's what their focus was at that time to bring some style into it and because all the tricks were there. They just needed a little extra flair and a little style and that was the time to do it. This year, the gnarliest thing that I probably saw was David Crichton's uh, alley of flat spin at the World Ski Invitational. That was off the meat rack. It was pretty sick. <laughs> um, Crichton went for it that day. He was charging. Style is developing so crazy now in the last years. I'm scared to see what it's going to be like in the next couple. Dumont is pretty much a self-motivated master that can go out every single day and kill it like first run not be scared not any hesitation just go out and throw down pretty much tricks that are like one quarter of the size smaller than things you do in competition you know like every day he goes out it's just 
the same thing as in a comp. He's not during a competition really going crazy or anything. It's just bringing it to a little bit higher of a level than his regular day skiing. He's just a really smart kid that will bring skiing to another level. All the guys basically noticed Simon. Everyone was talking about Simon Dumont. You know, back in the day when we were filming, everyone was like, oh, is Simon coming? Is Simon coming? Because they knew that if he showed up on the shoot, he was going to push the level of the shoot, no matter what it was, whether it was rails or a park jump or whatever, or even backcountry. He was going for it. He was charging. And uh, all those guys were talking about him. When he showed up at the shoot, they were like, oh, man, now I'm going to have to step up because this 14 year old kid is going to blow me out of the water. And they knew it. And everyone knew it. And he was making a statement pretty much everywhere he went. The Dumont. I don't know, he seems like he's not really human. He's really small and for some hollow he's got some special strength inside of him. Unexplainable. Yeah, it was just that kid lucky enough to be able to travel around with, you know, all the legends of the sport. I think they accepted me, but I always felt like I had a little bit more something to prove. Always something more. And um I didn't really know where to, to prove it. And then, um, you know, X Games, I think that was the biggest venue. They were all there, everybody was competing, and it was, um, you know, my chance to prove that uh, I could hang with everybody. When I was 14, first X Games. What was that like? Uh, first X Games, I mean, my first contest was, or first major contest, not being on the East Coast, like a local contest. It was an X Games qualifier. Uh, First time I was, I actually remember being nervous. Nowadays, don't not so much nervous at all, but um, that first contest, most nervous I've ever been. My whole body was shaking, it was craziness. But um, yeah, moved on from there, got some experience. Went to X Games that year, didn't get last, which was pretty sweet. Uh, 14 years old, did my first nine actually, in the contest, and yeah, I mean, I think that was a big stepping stone. I realized that you could make a career out of it. I could still have as much fun, and I got to go, you know, on the competitive side, which is, which is something that um, is always appealing to me. If I can compete and try and win at something, I want to do it. And I love skiing, so, um, you know, it just seemed like the right thing to do. Well, Tanner was always a finesse guy. He rode the half pipe like a skateboarder, you know. Everything he did was flow and style, and, um, I remember that particular year, Candide and C.R. Johnson boosted. It was like when skiing went bigger than snowboarding in the half pipe. That's when everything changed for the half pipe, for skiing. Yeah, when X Games introduced half pipe, I think that was the dawn of uh, a new decade. C.R. and Candide definitely took the top honors, whether or not C.R. fell or not. You know, it was can first and second place, Candide and C.R. That was like the first time anybody saw what pipe skiing can become in the future if, you know if we you know kind of all come together and try to make it work i remember simon being up at the top and rolling into the half pipe and looking at me he goes i'm gonna go huge he had just seen candide and cr go macking in training and i remember him go so big and he just completely decked out he landed half on the deck it was crazy but he got back up surprisingly enough, like he always does, and, and uh, came back up to the top, made his runs. I think he almost qualified. I think he crashed again. He, it, was, it, was a, it was one of those go for broke situations, and he crashed at the bottom or something. And, but that was it. I knew that changed everything in, in half pipe. And sure enough, he came back the next year and won. When Simon steps in the gate, you know, the music comes on, and it's like, it's go time. You know it. And right when he drops in, I always yell to everybody around, show time. <laughs> I 
Filming's not really safe. I mean, we take all the precautions, you know, to make it safe. You know, trying to do the best we can, but really you're going out looking for pretty much the craziest thing you can do in the gnarliest of terrain and the craziest of situations. And especially back then, it was like, oh, we, let's try and get this kid to go, you know, 20 feet out of a quarter pipe and do a couple of flips. That was, that was what you wanted, you know? There's nothing safe about it, and Simon was, when he came on, he was like, <laughs> we'd all look at each other and be like, oh, Simon will do it, you know? And, and he would. Simon was the guy. He was like your test dummy. He was like your crash test dummy. But he usually made it work. That was the cool part about Simon. He, yeah! he was a calculated kid. But he had no fear. There's no fear in Simon Dumont. Cable. Oh! Oh my God. We were doing cable cams, he landed on this cable, and he freaking, he ate it. He hit the deck, flew into the inside of the pipe, and he walked away and went into the bushes for like 30 minutes, and no one saw him. He just went into the bushes after being on the ground for 10 minutes, like wincing in pain. And then he came back out and just started skiing again. And he had like an epic day. But I, I thought he was going to the hospital at first. Like he was, it was gnarly. I mean, just life in general has risks. And there's a lot of variables out there. There's so many things that could go wrong, but uh, you just got to um, go out there and make sure you're loving it, because I mean, any day you could seriously get injured. We were shooting a, a step over gap jump. The session was going really well. People were, you know, Simon especially, was just boosting over this gap and threw the, one of the nicest zero spins, so big, so styly. And sort of as the shoot was winding down, I noticed that there was kind of a cool um, rock wall right next to the where the gap was. He got caught up, and that was his first like brush with um, the hospital. I think really, he broke his collarbone like straight in half, like snapped his car the collarbone. That was, I think, his first real trip to the hospital for skiing. As soon as he was healthy, he was skiing again. With zero fear factor. It's pretty typical Simon. Certain things put you in check, but at the same time, it's, it's what you love and what you're hungry for, and every day I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna put it all on the table, and if something does happen, you know, it's, it's part of the game, and I'll either, you know, start you know, going through physio and getting strong again, or, you know, if I, something happens, end up passing away, I mean, I'll be doing it in something I love, and yeah, can't regret it. I was, uh, I was sitting at home and I got a phone call from Ben Mullen, who was a poor boy cinematographer at the time. And he said, you know, he said, I think I just watched Simon die. And I'm like, what? And he said, uh, he just overshot a tabletop by over 100 feet to flat ice. And I was just like, oh my God. And I'm like, you know, he said, he's actually moving. I can't believe he's alive. They're taking him to the hospital right now. As soon as I took off, or as soon as I was in the tranny, I knew I was going to overshoot. So um, yeah, I tried to carve off the jump a little bit, get rid of as much speed as I could, and 
Yeah, as soon as I went over the knoll, I knew it was going to be bad. Uh, didn't really land with any tranny left. Landed dead flat. Tried to make sure that I dispersed my body as well as I could. And yeah, that was it. I, you know, six minutes later, I woke up and I was a little sore. I felt like I pulled a groin muscle. I didn't think it was too, too bad. I was like thanking somebody because I should have been dead. And yeah, fractured my pelvis in three places, ruptured my spleen, and you know, part of the game. When I saw the footage, I was just stunned that Simon could walk away from a hit like that. Um, one of the worst crashes I've ever seen. And uh, you know, a, a major crash like that can really affect you, and, and some skiers never recover from a, from a big injury like that. And, uh, you know, Simon being the, the guy that he is, he, uh, he was back. I think I saw him on skis like two months later, which is astounding after the hit he took and the number of injuries he got. And uh, it's kind of a testament to Simon's personality. He's, he's tough and he, uh, he's a guy that you just can't keep down. You know, he wants to be out there showing that he's the best. And as quick as he can do that, he's going to be there. A lot of people out there in mainstream America can relate to Simon. He's a competitor and he's not afraid to say, I like to compete and I like to win. And, uh, and that's something the sport needs. You know, if we're all a bunch of artists trying to uh, express ourselves, uh, th that doesn't always relate to the public. Yeah, you know, the first one of the X Games, I was in the start gate and I just went down and I was going to throw the run I knew and we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, I won. So then, I go into that next year and I know I have what it takes to win. I already won, so why can't I do it again? You know, step up my game a little bit, learn a trick here, maybe perfect this a little bit. And you know, it worked again for me that year. And I wanted to keep that streak rolling. And I think um, I might have stepped on some toes, you know. Um, Tanner Hall at that time was untouchable in all aspects of skiing. There was a place in time when Tanner was like the king. And there was, everyone was gunning for Tanner. He was the best skier in the world. He was a, at, at everything, basically, you know, when it had to do with competing from the park or the pipe. And I know that Simon, at some point, was like one of those guys gunning for him. The, and the difference between Simon and the other guys is Simon would go for broke to beat him. When Simon won a second year, it was, it was like the battles were made. The TV hype, the, the, the press from it, you know, around the world was Tanner versus Simon. And that's when it started. Whether they wanted it, wanted it to be there or even knowing it was there, it started. It happened right then. As soon as Simon won, Tanner had his own target. While everyone was going after Tanner and Simon, Tanner was going after Simon. He knew he was the guy at that point for it. There was no one else on the planet he wanted to be. It was him. The unique thing about action sports is there's no rule book, but to be in action sports, that you, you've given that rule book away. Like you knew that that's what you were getting into. I know that um, that's what I love about action sports, but at the same time, when it comes to competing, it's tough, you know? Like you don't know what those judges are wanting that night. You never know. You just go down, you do what you know, and then it can either go your way or it can't go your way. You know, those first two years, I might not have had the most technically sound run, but I feel like I blew people's mind with amplitude. And that's what I brought to the table. And those first two years, it worked for me. I think after he saw me win those two X Games, he wanted to just get it back and take it away from me. And that's when we stepped into the ring. And I think it was 2006, he came heavy hitting, swinging hard. And uh, yeah, you know, grabbed his medal back. Competing against Simon's really intense, you know. I, we definitely have two different vibes at the top of the contest scene. You know, Simon's like to get in his focus and get to get, get into his zone. He's really, just really intense. It's kind of tough to talk to him up at the up, up in the start gate sometimes. It's, it's just intense. Everything about Simon in competitions is really intense. I mean, he's there to do his job and he takes it very seriously. And you know how hard he skis. Any at any moment, he's pushing it so hard where any little thing goes wrong, he could be in big trouble. I think that's why Simon is who he is today, you know, and he's brought the level of pipe skiing and the level of skiing up so much every year. I tell you, Simon's brought an almost entirely new run this season.
but he's bringing it with the Simon Dumont amplitude, the 20 foot airs. If he can put this run down, I think he can take Tanner Hall out of that top spot. Watch out for this guy, Simon Dumont. It's all or nothing right now. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable amplitude. Tanner Hall called it from Dumont. Dumont's got to lay this run down. He's got to make it to the bottom clean. So far, so good. Winding up the 12, 63 and a half rotations. Rock solid. The crowd is going crazy here. He's got the 720. One more trick. He's done it. Oh. Tanner Hall looking on. <laughs> he knows what Simon just did. Friends and rivals. Obvious concern for his buddy Tanner, but I'll say this right now. That was one of the most impressive super pipe runs I've ever seen. Yeah, Simon Dumont delivering. He knows the judges at X Games want amplitude. And it oh. is not enough. It is not enough. Missing it by one point. That means Tanner Hall has earned back to back gold medals in super pipe. Now, like, like we said, fire. it's hard to say a rivalry when these guys are really best friends. They push one another like brothers would out there on the mountain. There's only a select few people in the world that come along and put their heart, soul, blood, sweat, tears, make huge sacrifices just so they can, you know, stay on their game and to see how far me and Simon have actually come and pushed the sport. It's, it's definitely rewarding and to actually see the results like they are, like way bigger than I think me and Simon ever thought they could get. Yeah, man, that's a good feeling, you know, and I think that feeling will be with us for the rest of our lives. You know, it's been the greatest thing for the sport, without a doubt. The, the drama that is created, you couldn't go back five years and write this stuff. Um, behind that whole X Games thing, those two guys are more similar when it comes to pipe skiing than anyone will ever know. They both want to win, they both hate losing, and they train harder than any athlete out there. And that's not to say the other athletes aren't training hard, but to see their drive right now and where they have taken it, it's so impressive and they really do feed off each other. And depending on what camp you're in, sure, at that one given moment when one wins and the other doesn't, you know, you feel for whoever it is. There's no question that, you know, when you see them hug at the end of a pipe run, um, those are true feelings of them hugging, you know, with an appreciation of how far they've been able to bring the sport. And not one of them as individuals could have ever brought the sport to this level. Who do you think is the biggest competition for tomorrow night? Well, no disrespect to anybody, but Simon Dumont is definitely the number one contender at every single contest, and it's the one kid that likes to, you know, make me push myself out of my ab ability. But, I mean, there's a lot of kids coming up, you know what I mean? I mean, I think it was all fabricated for TV. I'm not going to lie and say Simon didn't push me. He was the number one dude out there making me want to be on my game and be at the top of my level. But I think that's more of a feeding ground right there and not a rivalry. We're two competitors that are really competitive people. And I think through media's eyes, it can look like probably we don't like each other. But what is the media around? In one night, there's 364 days the media doesn't see us. We just fed off each other for the last four years to the point where it, you know, it got to the point where I think people, if Simon beat me, everybody thought I was pissed. Or if I beat Simon, everybody thought he was pissed. And I, uh, I'm here to tell you, it's, it's, it wasn't that way. At the end of the day, we're both on the podium, we're both you know, skiing at our top level, and we're both having fun. And then on top of that is just having that many more eyes on just me and him and having a rivalry brewing, or so they say on TV. It's, you know, I think it was good for the sport, but you just don't get it twisted. Me and Simon are homies. There's you know, how many people on the sides of the pipe and how many viewers at home cheering and probably you know, on the edge of their seat watching this thing go down every year. Either way, I knew that we were putting on a good show and we were doing something sick for the sport. We just want the same thing for skiing. We feel the, we feel the same way. We want to see it grow. We want to see it progress. We want to see it go in the right directions. We want it to be labeled as cool, you know what I mean? And, you know, what me and Simon were doing, it, it, it was big. I don't even think me and him knew it. I think, uh, we understand each other better than we even know.
look what happened. I mean, Simon plus Tanner equals skiing, and that's straight up right there, you know. He surprises me every year with the boundaries that he pushes as an athlete. Um, you know, whether it's winning X Games or two years ago winning back-to-back -back events on a Saturday and a Sunday in, in two separate states. You know, getting up early enough in the morning, you know, to catch a flight, to fly to another state, to get picked up and go and win the World Superpipe Champs after he won the Honda Ski Tour, the overall and the event the day before in Squaw Valley. So that, those kind of things, it's just like there's always something driving him. Tanner started going pretty big. And the next thing you know, as soon as Tanner started going big, I saw Simon step up 10 feet every time. Like he was, all of a sudden, Simon was charging. And he knew it wasn't the right quarter pipe to do it in, but that didn't matter. It became a competition and he wanted to win. The quarter pipe was more uh, a self thing than, than anything. I mean, I went to Aspen and I hit the quarter pipe a little bit and went pretty big. And I knew there was a mark out there. I mean, it doesn't have to do, it doesn't matter if it's a snowboarding mark or if it was a BMX mark or whatever, it was a mark that was there. And I saw it and I, I saw it. I mean, I was at Aspen and I actually saw that mark and I knew it was possible. And uh, you know, I hurt myself. And that's when I really started questioning. Like, I was so close, but then I hurt myself and I got this much farther away from it. And uh, I hated that. I hated that an injury or anything can say that I can't do that, you know? Like, so I was like, I'm gonna prove myself wrong and I'm gonna go and get it. And he pushes the limits to the point where you know something like that can happen. And to see him take that hit, separate his shoulder, and a week later go ski a half pipe competition, you know, he's just tough. He doesn't, he doesn't want to miss a beat. That's why he gets up. That's why he pushes himself through pain. He was competing against himself. He set this goal. He wanted to achieve this. And there wasn't anybody to compete against but himself. It wasn't as, um, I think, easy as he anticipated. I mean, yeah, I was super scared. I mean, a lot of things went wrong. I hurt myself a lot, you know? separated my shoulder, uh, bruised my heel, hurt my knee. Uh, yeah, a lot of things went wrong, but I wanted it. You know, I didn't want any of that stuff to, st I don't like anything saying I can't do it. Anything, even if it's myself, even if it's my body telling me I can't do it. So uh, yeah, we got really close the first day. I think we got like 30, 31 feet, but uh, a little too much of bird on it. It was, you know, it was, uh, a little soft, yep, yep. so my skis would break through, but then when I hit the vert, it'd be really hard, so it'd pop me off the wall. And I landed probably 55 feet to flat, bruised my heel. Is that what it is? Okay. So, uh, world record is, uh, you know, getting a little farther away, but um, we're here at the little ski patrol area trying to find out where I can get some physical therapy or a numbing shot for tomorrow, and we're gonna try and give her. So, uh, world record. Right here, and the stags go on. It keeps drifting away from me. It's pissing me off. I hate quarter pipes. I'm scared as shit of them, but I want to do this for myself and overcome it. But I don't know. When Simon gets in into the zone, I guess you could call it, he is fired up. There is. I I've learned over the years how to communicate with Simon when he gets to that point, and that is I do not talk to him because he truly doesn't want any, any outside influence because he's so focused. The special thing about Simon Dumont is, is the way he charges and the way he, it's just infectious. You watch him get going and just you get the, the energy, whether you're at X Games in the half pipe or you're here at this quarter pipe with just a few people here and all of a sudden you just see it in his eyes and you know you're going to see something special.
you know, when it came down to it, at the end of the day, it was for myself. You know, I wanted to overcome my fear, and uh, I did. So now I gotta find something else that scares me, and I gotta beat it. Who knows if it was a big day for skiing? I mean, that's not for me to judge. That's the ski community, but it was a big day for myself. You know, I realized that I could actually do whatever I want, anything I want to do, as long as I put some time, put some effort into it, and um, you know, look past all the bodily injuries that could happen, then yeah, it could, it's possible. Well, from 1997 to 2009, the sport of skiing just jumped light years, fully light years. It was the dawn of a new era in an action sport that basically grew to be the fastest progressing sport in the world today. No other sport that I know, every year people come out and not only progress the level, but basically bring it to a whole new level where it kind of made last year look kind of insignificant in a way. The sky's the limit where pipe skiing is going right now. There's so much room for growth and so much room for opportunity that, you know, I think me and Simon have left a good mark so far on like where we think we should we should have that sport going. And I think it's up to the new generation just to, you know, basically take our torches and run with it. Who knows where it's gonna go? I have no idea. Because every year it just gets crazier and it just progresses so much and you know, the, the sky's the limit.